All right, so today we're gonna to look at more linear equations with brackets. So in other words, we're looking at more of those problems in which your uh, variable, your x, uh, is locked away inside some brackets somewhere. So today's plan is we're gonna start by quickly reviewing two-step linear equations. Um, that was the stuff we did before we looked at brackets problems. Uh, and I'll be getting you to try these on your own. So in other words, I'll ask you to pause the video when we get there uh, and write them down on a piece of paper and then see when I go over them, uh, whether or not you got them right. Uh, then we will the, ugh, we will then review linear equations involving brackets. These were in the form a times in brackets x plus b equals c, or where we have x plus b in brackets up on the top of a numerator and a fraction over a equals c. Uh, lastly, we'll take a look at how linear equations with brackets can come up in real world situations. So in other words, word problems. Who it's going to be a loaded day. Here we go. Let's get going. Uh, so here's some uh, two-step linear equation problems. I want you to pause the video right here and give both of these questions a try. So pause the video, give them a try. All right, I'm going to go over these now. Uh, so first things first, hopefully you remember we got to use reverse bed mass, right? What that means is we need to start by getting rid of any addition and subtraction, and then moving on and getting rid of any division and multiplication, then any exponents, and then any brackets, right? Well, in this case, first things first, if we want to get rid of any addition or subtraction, and again, that's in reference to this x here, that means we need to get rid of this minus 12. Uh, to get rid of a minus 12, we just do the opposite. So we'll add 12 to both sides. And this is going to give us 5x equals negative 4 plus 12, which is positive 8. Then we just have to divide by 5 on both sides. Uh, so that's going to give us x equals 8 over 5, which I would accept as a final answer. But if you're more of a decimal person, that's no big deal. If you're more of a decimal person, you write this as x equals, let's see that, I think that's 1.6. Let's just double check. Yep, it is. It's 1.6. Boom. Okay, so again, I have no preference between brackets and fractions. I think brackets might be a little bit better usually, um, but again, in this case, there was, there was no issue with decimal. Uh, all right, so this next one, two-thirds x plus one over two equals three and a third. Uh, I've kind of like rambled on several times about this. We don't like having mixed numbers. Like just in math, we absolutely hate these. So we got to we got to change that into a improper fraction first here. So this is going to give us two thirds x plus one half equals three and one third is three times three, which is nine plus one is ten. So that's ten thirds. Okay. So first things first, get rid of that mixed number uh, and go right to your improper fraction. Then, of course, no different than the last one, we just got to get rid of any addition or subtraction. So I'm going to minus one half from both sides first. Uh, and then we run into a new problem. This is 10 over 3 minus 1 over 2. You can't actually subtract fractions or add fractions for that matter, unless they have a common denominator. So between 3 and 2, I think the lowest common denominator here would be 6. Uh, so in other words, we can write this as 2 thirds x, nothing wrong with leaving that one alone equals, if we're going to turn this into something over 6, it's going to be 20 over 6. So I multiply the top and the bottom by 2. Uh, minus, to turn this thing over 6, we have to multiply the top and the bottom by 3. Uh, so it'd be 3 over 6, right? Uh, now we can subtract these two. When you subtract fractions, you just subtract the numerator. So we've got 2 thirds x equals 17 over 6. Uh, and then the last step here is we've got to get rid of this 2 thirds. Notice this is 2 thirds times x. So we've got to do the opposite of that. We've got to divide by two thirds on both sides. So this is gonna leave us with x equals 17 over six divided by two over three. But yet again, we have yet another problem. Like I swear these fraction problems just cause us nothing but issues. Uh, dividing fractions is a nightmare, right? So instead of dividing these two fractions, we should keep change flip. So let's keep the first one, 17 over six, uh, change the sign to times and then flip this other fraction. So it's gonna be three over two. And then you just multiply straight across uh, 17 times three, I don't want to be wrong here, so I'm going to use a calculator. It's 51 over six times two. I'm pretty sure I got that one. That's 12. Uh, and then last but not least, you should check to see if that reduces. Uh, I know both of these numbers are going to divide by three. Uh, so if I divide both the top and the bottom by three, we can simplify this down to be 17 over and 12 divided by three is four. So X equals 17 over four. That would be a good final answer in this case. Fraction questions are a nightmare, right? So if you didn't get that one right, don't kick yourself. Uh, but you know, just, just be aware that these kind of questions do come around and they are questions that we can ask. All right, here's some brackets questions. Uh, once again, I want you to pause the video here and give these ones a try and I'll go over them in a second. 
All right, there's a couple different ways of going about these. I'm not going to show you both methods. We went over it in a Zoom the other day. Uh, so I'm just going to use the method I'm a little bit more comfortable with. And that's being, let's divide both sides by 3.2 on both sides, right? So I like dividing away the thing that's on the outside of the brackets first, rather than double dipping it through. To me, it just works a little quicker. But again, it's up to you entirely. So if you did a different method, but you ended up getting the same answer, kudos. It all works the same, right? Anyway, so x minus 4.2 equals negative 20.8 divided by 3.2, which is negative 6.5. Next up, this becomes a much more simple linear equation. We just got to add 4.2 to both sides. And then x is all of a sudden all by itself. So x equals negative 6.5 plus 4.2 is negative 2.3. There it is. Uh, just I'm going to pause right here for you guys for a second. Uh, I just wanted to mention there's no shame in using a calculator in all this, right? I don't think I've ever explicitly mentioned it before because I think a lot of you, especially on your formative quizzes so far, have just tried to go ham at this and just do it without a calculator. Please guys, by all means, you guys are in grade nine by now. Calculators are gonna become more mainstay. I know that seems a little bit backwards that you might think, oh, well, you know, we, we should kind of know mental math by now. Um, but, but seriously, like just, just use a calculator. You don't have to use mental math in this one. Um, I mean, in other years where we have a PAT that has a mental math portion on it, yeah, we would be training you for that. But for now, guys, like let's, let's just focus on learning, uh, you know, how to deal with linear equations. The mental math can come a little bit later. Uh, anyway, that's enough of an aside right now. Next question. It basically looks like the same setup as the other one. X is located in here, though. We'll, we'll deal with that in a second because it's going to cause us a little bit of a problem in a second here. Um, but I'm going to start by dividing both sides by negative 1.5. I've seen in the past some people think you got to like add 1.5 to both sides, but keep in mind this negative 1.5 is like butted right up against the brackets here. That means it's multiplying, so you got to do the opposite of that. You got to divide. Anyway, that's going to leave us with 9.2 minus x equals negative 10.65 divided by negative 1.5, which is 7.1. Now here's where something funny kind of happens. They, these kinds of questions just drive people up the wall. Uh, there's a couple different ways of going about this, but personally, I like just saying, you know what? We have a 9.2 minus x equals 7.1. This is technically a plus 9.2 because it's a positive 9.2 here. Let's get rid of that by minusing 9.2 on both sides. And if you do that, you're going to be left with minus x. This minus sign doesn't go anywhere. So minus x equals 7.1 minus 9.2, which is negative 2.1. So negative x equals negative 2.1. The question here now is, what would positive x be? If negative x is negative 2.1, what's positive x? Some of you are probably like shaking your head right now because it's, it's going to seem pretty clear. Uh, to, to figure this out, of course, to get rid of this negative, let's just divide both sides by negative 1. That clears up this negative here, and that leaves us with x equals negative 2.1 divided by negative 1 is just positive 2.1, which some of you are probably like, oh, yeah, of course, right? Negative x was negative 2.1. That means positive x is positive 2.1 right? It's just the opposite of each other. That's all, right? Anyway, moving on. All right, just two more questions that I'm going to get you guys to pause the video here and try on your own. So uh, pause the video, and we'll go over it in a second. All right, so the first one here, x minus 5 all divided by 3 equals negative 4. Uh, I think probably, oops, uh-oh, going forward. Uh, I think probably the best way about going into this one is times by 3 on both sides. So we can say x minus 5 equals negative four times three, which is negative 12. Uh, that got rid of our divide by three, of course. Uh, and now that we have x minus five equals negative 12, I think it's pretty clear we just need to add five on both sides. And this will give us x equals negative 12 plus five, which is negative seven. Now, if you're ever not uh, sure if you got the answer co uh, correct or not, you would always just take this number that you got and plug it back into your original question, right? So the original question would be negative seven minus five, which is negative 12, divided by 3, which is negative 4, equals negative 4, right? So you can always check to see if you got your answer right by plugging it back in the original question and then just using bed mass to solve from there, whatever floats your boat, right? All right, as for this other one, uh, this one is absolutely beefy. There was one like this on uh, a formative quiz we had last week. Uh, hopefully you remember the little bit of advice I gave you. Pick away at it one piece at a time. Don't try to bite off more than you can chew. Just do a little piece at a time here. Uh, so what I would recommend is I'd first get rid of this divide by 7 by multiplying by 7 on both sides. That's going to leave us with 4 times x minus 2 
equals three over two times seven over one, which is 21 over two. All right, next up, we gotta get rid of this four somehow. There's a couple different ways we can do it. I'm just gonna go ham on this one. I'm gonna just divide by four on both sides. But we got a fraction divided by a number, right? 21 over two divided by four, that's like saying divided by four over one. That's a fraction divided by a fraction. We gotta keep change flip, right? So this is gonna give us X minus two equals keep 21 over two change. So times one over four. This is going to give us X minus two equals uh, 21 times one is 21 over two times four is eight. So 21 over eight. And then last but not least, we got to add two on both sides. Add two, boing, boing. Uh, and you got to think now this is a fraction plus a number. Keep in mind this number, this plus two here is like two over one. The only way you can add two fractions together is if you have a common denominator. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that a common denominator we could get here is eight. Uh, so if I just take two over one and I multiply it by eight over eight, we will be golden, right? So X equals 21 over eight plus, if you multiply this whole thing by eight over eight, because that's just gonna change the way it looks, that's gonna be 16 over eight, which hopefully you can see 16 over eight is like 16 divided by eight, which is two, right? So I didn't change what it was, I just changed what it looked like. Uh, and now they have the same denominator. Uh, so since they're the same kind of thing, you can now add them together. This is gonna give us X equals 21 plus 16. I'm pretty sure that's 37 over eight. And I'll tell you right now, there's nothing that you can divide away from 37 that you can also divide eight by. So you know what? We can just say that is now simplified. X equals 37 over eight. If you tried to change this into decimals and then go from there, I mean, I'm sure it could work, but I wouldn't do it. I'd leave things as fractions. Fractions are a little bit more exact. I know they're harder to deal with for most of us, but yeah, get used to it. All right, anyway, here's a word problem. You guys already kind of saw this a second ago when I accidentally flipped forward to it. The average overall daily temperature in February in Whitehorse, Yukon Territory is negative 13.2 degrees Celsius. The average low temperature is negative 18.1 degrees Celsius. Find the average high temperature. So let me just kind of like, base some background on this question here. When we talk about an overall average daily temperature, that's the average between the high and the low, right? So the average overall daily temperature is like the right in between, between the high and the low temperature for a day, right? So that average overall is negative 13.2 degrees Celsius. We know the low temperature on average on a normal February day in, in Whitehorse is negative 18.1 we wanna find that average high temperature. Now, just in case you've forgotten from previous years how to find an average, uh, an average, at least when we talk about a mean average, which is generally what we, what we mean by that, haha. Anyway, so what that means is we just, what that means is we just have to add the high and the low and then divide by two, right? So you just add all your pieces of data together and then you divide by the number of pieces of data. Uh, so I'll write that out. I'll make that a little bit more uh, formal, your high, plus your low all divided by two is equal to your uh, daily average, we'll say, okay? Now we know our daily average. Daily average is negative 13.2. We also know our low, that's negative 18.1. All we're looking for is the average high. Just so I don't have to write the word high out, I'll just say it's H plus your daily low, which is uh, negative 18.1, all divided by two, equals your daily average, which is negative 13.2. Question is, how do we solve for this average high temperature? Well, we gotta get rid of this divide by two first. This is like one of those old brackets problems kind of thing, because imagine this numerator all in its own set of brackets. So let's multiply by two on both sides first. That's gonna give us, I'll just write it out, times by two, times by two. That's gonna give us H plus negative 18.1 equals negative 13.2 times two is negative 26.4. And now we gotta get rid of this negative 18.1 here, this plus negative 18.1. There's a couple different ways of doing this. Um, personally, what I'm most comfortable with is when I think I'm adding a negative number, I prefer to change this. So I'm gonna get rid of this brackets here because these brackets aren't really doing anything. Uh, I prefer to change this from being a plus a negative number to minus a positive number. Right, so H plus negative 18.1 is the same thing as just saying H minus 18.1. To me, that's just easier to like, you know, work my mind around it. If you don't like that though, we can go back to what the original thing said, plus negative 18.1. 
Uh, you can just think, oh, I got to do the opposite of this. So I got a minus negative 18.1 from both sides. To me, my brain just doesn't work that way. So I'm going to go my way. Uh, plus negative 18.1 is like thinking minus 18.1. So to get rid of this now, to me, this seems way easier. Just add positive 18.1 to both sides. The good news is in this kind of a question, we have a context. In other words, we know we have like a real world situation we're working with. So if our answer just seems like garbage, you know, we can always go back to the drawing board, right? Clearly this number, this average high temperature we get should be bigger than this negative 13.2 and certainly a lot bigger than negative 18.1. Well, let's find out. Our high temperature, negative 18, or sorry, negative 26.4. Let's see, negative 26.4, just typing in my calculator, plus 18.1. That's gonna give us negative 8.3 degrees Celsius. So yeah, it is a warmer temperature, of course, than not only the overall daily temperature, but of course also the overall average low temperature. Woo, there it is, okay? So the average high in Whitehorse in February, negative 8.3 degrees Celsius. All right, hopefully that makes some sense. Anyway, we'll try another one. Uh, Zari is selling homemade handcrafted boomerangs, like, like most people do these days. It's a lucrative business. She us usually charges customers $60 per boomerang, but offers a discount if they order five or more, because you, know, you always need some backups. Anyway, Keegan purchased five boomerangs and paid $287.50 uh, before tax. We won't worry about tax in this kind of question. Uh, so part A, this is gonna be a two-part question. How much did Zari reduce the price by? Hmm. I'm gonna ask that you pause the video here and see if you can figure this one on your own, figure this one out on your own, and I will go over it in just a second. Okay, so here's how I would personally do this. We know Keegan paid this much money for five boomerangs. So we can figure out the cost per boomerang by just taking this overall price and dividing it into five pieces. So 287.50 divided by five boomerangs. Uh, throw this in my calculator real quick. And that gives me 57.50. And that represents the cost per boomerang. So dollars per boomerang. Don't think I've ever said that before. Uh, anyway, so 57.50, that's what Keegan paid for these boomerangs. Uh, the question is asking, how much did Zari reduce the price by? Well, she took the price down by, uh, you can even just do mental math here, $2.50. But if you couldn't do that, you can just say it's 60 minus 57.50. And that, that does equal $2.50. Like if you put that in your calculator, you're good to go, right? So the answer to this question is, how much does I reduce the price by? She reduced it by $2.50. So I can even say $2.50 off. Huge discount, huge discount she's offering. That's really, really a lucrative business. Uh, all right, so part B, create a linear equation that represents the cost C. We can say that's the total cost, just to make things easier. The total cost, C, for a customer that ordered X number boomerangs, assuming that X is a number greater than or equal to five. That's what this little mouth kind of thing looks like. X is a number greater than or equal to five. So in other words, this customer is getting that discount, okay? Let's create a linear equation that represents this. I'll let you pause the video right here and give this one a try. Okay, so I'm gonna go over this now. There's a couple different things you could get. I'm going to start with what I think is probably the simplest solution. We know that the customer is paying $57.50 uh, per boomerang, right? So you could just say, uh, since we're looking at the overall total cost, you could just say the overall cost C equals $57.50 times X. That's about it, right? So the cost could just be that. Not a big deal, okay? That I think is probably the simplest way of doing it. But if you wanna be really creative and crafty, you could go a little crazier than this. You could say that the cost is in brackets, $60 minus 250, because that's the discount times X, right? Now, by order of operations, if you were to solve this, like let's say the customer ordered seven boomerangs, so X would be seven. You have to do the stuff in the brackets first. So that would give you 5750 and then you multiply by X. Anyway, not the most revolutionary question, but still something to get your mind thinking about these sorts of things. Uh, brackets problems don't really come around too often in terms of word problems. So in other words, it's, it's kind of rare for us to see situations where this will even show up. But hey, you know what? It is what it is. It is what it is. All right, anyway, so practice. Page 320, questions 4 to 11. I assigned these questions before 
so you may have already finished them. I know a lot of you have said you already have, um, but I have a whole random, you know, selection here. I got charcuterie board versus worth of questions here. Uh, just some random hand-picked questions that I took out of the textbook that I thought, you know what, these ones are decent. There's six of them there, questions 12, 14, 15, 17, 18, and 21. Those questions I thought were pretty decent. Give those ones a try. Those ones that I just underlined there, those are all word problems. Uh, and as always, you know where I am. I'm in the Zoom. You can find me if you need me. Uh, best of luck, guys, and uh, talk to you later.